Hi, I'm Don Ware. I'm here to, today to talk a little bit about uh, Moore's Law. And to do that, we want to determine whether or not Moore's Law is dead. And uh, before we jump into that topic, let's talk about a little bit of where Moore's Law came from. So, in uh, 1965, Gordon Moore was working uh, for Fairchild. Uh, Gordon Moore, of course, is one of the two founders of Intel Corporation. Uh, he was asked by Electronics Magazine to uh, uh, write an article about the future of uh, fabrication of semiconductors. And so in that article, he talked about uh, rough, that the increase in density of the uh, transistors would be something on the order of uh, double once every year. And uh, he added, also added that this would, uh, this would remain constant until uh, about 1975. Uh, and also he added this one line, which is that the number of components per integrated circuit for a minimum cost. So in other words, yeah, you could increase the density of the transistor, but you would end up paying more to do that in the fab. And of course, then you would have to pass that cost on to the people that were buying your chip. So what he was really talking about was on the right-hand side there, the curve, was to get the density of the chip at the lowest cost. Uh, that way you would be the most competitive uh, when you were going to sell your product. A very important part of uh, business. So. In 1975, he revised that. He said that uh, it would continue to double annually until about 1980, after which, after that point, it would decrease to a rate of doubling approximately once every two years. Um, and the, the second law, the capital cost of the semiconductor fab would increase exponentially over time as well. So the more dense, the more expensive it is to build the fabrication processes to, to, do, to do that. And uh, he's been right about that. So looking back from uh, 1971, these are mostly Intel chips. There are some Motorola and there are uh, some National Semiconductor and there are also some Fairchilds on here as well. Uh, but really, the, this graph starts with the Intel 4004 introduced in 1971 and runs all the way up to the present in the, uh, with the introduction of the 9700K and the 9900K uh, CPUs. So it's pretty much linear, as you can see. Yeah, it's been doubling every two years uh, in, in, uh, in the, in the uh, chip density. But uh, the major contributor to that was uh, in, the, in the performance side of things was Dennard scaling. In 1974, an IBMer by the name of Dennard observed that the voltage and current would be proportional to the, to the dimensions of the transistor. So in other words, as I shrank the transistor, the uh, power needed to uh, turn the transistor on and off was less uh, in proportion to the size. So in other words, if I wanted more speed out of the transistor, all I did was I brought the voltage up. And you guys at Overclock, you know that. Uh, you bring the voltage up and you can increase the uh, clock rate of the, uh, of the, uh, uh, of the uh, transistors. So that's great, but there was one problem. Uh, Denner forgot to include leakage current and startup current in his calculations. And so when we got to <laughs> 2003, uh, we ended up um, not being able to, get, to cross that boundary and, and, uh, with the single uh, CPU core. Uh, we weren't able to get past, I think, I, I'm not quite sure what Project Tejas or Tejas uh, uh, that Intel was trying to reach, whether it was, I know we were going from 4 gigahertz at that time on the Pentium 4, so I would imagine they were probably trying to go uh, to 5 or, or maybe even to 6, but they weren't able to get there because the uh, thermal uh, limits of the chip went out of control as well as the power requirements just went off the scale and they they weren't able to produce a chip that was uh, uh, economically or or uh, commercially viable and so they canceled it and they went back to the drawing board and instead of doing uh, single core they introduced multiple cores and they lowered the clock rate so the hope was to gain performance with the two cores but at a much slower clock frequency and they did that, and you'll notice there's another drop in about 2010, and that's 
the introduction of the uh, quad core uh, CPUs. And the quad core continued up until uh, a couple of years ago when the 8700K was introduced and they started adding cores again. So as you add cores, if you've looked at the specs for the Intel chips, you'll notice that they have to bring the clock down. And the reason for that is, again, the denner scaling. So you can, they are able to increase it to a certain point, but when they hit the limit again at the four gigahertz or five gigahertz level, where, where I'm not sure where that is, but wherever that, that or it goes off the scale, then they have to bring it down again. I think it's pretty close to five gigahertz because we're kind of, we're kind of seeing that uh, with the 9900K. But we should be, if Dennard scaling had held, by this time we should be over 10 gigahertz, and we're not. So that's the life, that's the world we live in. And so <laughs> that prompted uh, Herb Sutter to write this article for Dr. Dobbs in 2005 at the free lunch is over. And now we need to do the hard stuff, which is to move to concurrent programming. But he was looking at the same thing I was. So he, he's, he's got the green curve is the uh, Moore's law, the doubling of every two years. And then he plotted uh, the clock speed and the power and the performance per clock. And you'll notice they all, f all the last three flatline. And so that's why we're into multiple cores and, and we need to find ways to take better advantage of that. And we'll discuss that further a little bit later. So, so what, what was the problem? What, what happened? And, and the magic mark was that below 130 nanometer, uh, when, the, when the chip densities were above 130 nanometer, all good. We could, uh, you know, we didn't have any problem with, uh, with, the, uh, uh, with the thermal performance of the chips. Yeah, the Pentium 4 ran hot, but it didn't self-destruct. Um, 130, and once we got below 130 nanometers, then the heat generation, as I said, went off the scale. Uh, but even continuing down the line with the multi-cores, we're going to hit a point where we're at the, with the size of the atom. And you have two dimensions in chip design. You have the width between the, at, between the uh, transistors, but you also have the, the, the height. And, and it's the height that's the problem because we're pretty close to one atom in width on the height already. But the fin fabs, uh, the fin fets on the sides protect it from uh, leakage, from, uh, from the electrons from leaking in into uh, another transistor. So uh, they're able to push that density down pretty well. And that'll continue for a while. What's the problem with adding cores? At some point, that reaches a, a level of diminishing returns with uh, symmetrical multiprocessing as well. So the thought is, is if I have eight cores at 4.1 gigahertz, I've got a 32.8 gigahertz machine, right? No, it don't work that way. Sorry about that. Um, why? Well, the first problem is you have overhead to coordinate the cores. In other words, I have to prevent cores from executing the same code. So I need to make sure I'm managing that code. So something has got to run in order to say, oh, you do this, you do that, you do this. Uh, and then the second thing is I have cache memory concurrency. I don't want the cores overriding uh, cache memory that, that this process on this core is using. And I don't want to be reading uh, your cache memory. Uh, it might, it'll blow my application out of the water as well. So that's a problem and something, in, again, has to run to manage that. Third is Amdahl's law, and that's at the application level. If I have single-threaded processes, I'm locked to a single core. And so the more of the single-threaded processes I have, the less concurrency I can get out of that application. So uh, I've heard, <laughs> I don't know where people come up with this stuff, but I've heard that Amdahl's law is dead. Uh, sorry, guys, I don't think so. Uh, <laughs> I'll do a video on this later, and I'll show you Amdahl's uh, law in use. Uh, so we've had, some, uh, we've had some advances in miniaturization, and this slide's a little dated uh, from when I started on it. Samsung is actually at 7 nanometer now uh, with, the, uh, with their 10, and uh, so is Apple. Intel is about to release their 10 nanometer CPUs later on this year. They've released them already for uh, the laptop. Um, and uh, IBM has demonstrated seven nanometer fabrications way back as far as 2016. We know that that works because uh, we're seeing Samsung use it, we're seeing AMD using it. 
Uh, and we also know that uh, IBM has, has demonstrated a five nanometer uh, fabrication of a chip. And in 2016, the Lawrence Berkeley Labs showed one nanometer transistors using carbon tubes and molybdenum disulfide. So we've got some, we've got some runway. We know we can get some more density out of the chip. But we've got one more problem. <laughs> well, several more problems. We've got one more problem, and that's dark silicon. And dark silicon started uh, occurring at, at below 45 nanometers. And what's going on here is that I, I have a, let's say I have a thermal design of 95 watts at my base clock. If I turn on all the transistors at, if, and I'm at 22 nanometers or 14 nanometers or 10 nanometers, uh, I can't turn them all on because if I do that, then I'm going to exceed the thermal design for the chip. So that's a problem. I've got this great density of, uh, of transistors, but I can't turn them all on without, without, blowing, without blowing my thermal design limit. So I have to turn them off. Um, and that is going on. That's happening. Um, and, the, and the more dense the chip becomes, the more dark silicon you have. If, if you noticed in AMD's benchmark results that they published at E3 the, this past week, you'll notice that, so we're going from 14 nanometer to seven nanometer. I would expect to see a doubling in performance, but we didn't see that in the benchmarks. We saw 30%. Well, the reason for that is not all those transistors are powered up. They haven't said it, but that's what I'm betting. I'm betting not all those transistors are powered up uh, and they can't power them up. They can power them up for a short period of time, but they can't keep their thermal limit under control if they do. Uh, and, and I'm not beating up on AMD. This is physics. Intel has the same problem. So does NVIDIA. They all have the same problem. If, they, if they're building to a thermal limit, they, they have to stay within it. Uh, you'll notice that even uh, uh, the 95 watt thermal limit that uh, uh, the 9900K has uh, that people were plugging in their their uh, processors into their motherboards and all of a sudden seeing 235 watts and going, hey, what, is, what is going on here? And that's that's dark current. That's the dark silicon uh, doing that. So uh, there's two more problems, and that's uh, lithography uh, is 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 going to be a challenge uh, to continue to use lithography to be able to uh, uh, to uh, create transistors on the uh, silicon wafer. Uh, the other problem is the wiring of those transistors becomes more complex. The wires become thinner and thinner and smaller and smaller. And so they build up resistance too. That's more heat. So now we have uh, smaller transistors are, uh, are also more susceptible to noise and air. So we've got to deal with that issue. Uh, the, the power needed to drive a transistor uh, decreases that, and we put more transistors on it. We exceed the power limits of the chip. We get more of the dark silicon. Uh, also, quantum tunneling uh, occurs, and, and that's when electrons uh, show up on, another, <laughs> on the transistor out of nowhere, and they prevent us from turning the chip off, on the transistor off. And so, that's a bad thing. Uh, turning on it, that's fine, that's a good thing, but turning it off, it, we also need to do that. And if uh, quantum tunneling occurs, we can't. Um, some think that Moore's Law is already dead. MIT published an article in 2016 saying Moore's Law is dead, now what? And they listed out a bunch of ways that we might look at uh, solutions to fit this. The Tech Republic published an article in 2018. They said Moore's Law is dead. And Samsung has actually been manufacturing uh, new fabs for their SSDs based on 3D. And uh, uh, so they think Moore's Law is dead. They haven't said it, but they, <laughs> they obviously think that or they would be building chips the same way. So the... Uh, so Moore's law ends, great, but you know it's just going to be a, another set of things that happen, another set of challenges that occur. Uh, you know, I've heard Moore's law is dead three times in in the last thirty years. Uh, I heard it in the mid '80s that we were we were dead. I heard it in the mid '90s that we were dead. I heard it uh, after the the fiasco with the scaling, uh, the denning scaling, and we're still we're still up on that. Tr if you look at the chart, we're still doubling performance. So and doubling the uh, transistor sizes, that is. We're doubling the transistor density. So uh, it ain't quite dead yet, but when it does occur, the best thing that, that we, some things I think we should do is remove the von Neumann bottlenecks. Um, there's a lot of time wasted in moving data. 
uh, moving data. Let me start with hard disk. We got to move it from hard disk into the main memory. From main memory, I got to move it to the cache on the CPU. And then from the cache, all into the next cache, and the next cache, and then finally into the register, and then back out again. So uh, that's a worst case, but um, that takes time. That needs to go. And that's von Neumann architecture. <coughs> Some of the ways that, uh, that we might deal with uh, getting rid of the von Neumann bottleneck is go to 3D stacking, which is what Samsung is doing. Uh, we could do specialization of the hardware through ASICs, FPGAs. Now, uh, the FPGAs are being used in the RISC-Vs uh, to off offload some of the CPU. Tensor cores are being used by NVIDIA in their latest GPUs, uh, as well as the ray tracing uh, components as well. Uh, we could go to brain-like architectures that IBM has shown in the True North. I think they have another project as well. I don't know the name of it, but uh, uh, maybe I'll look into that. Uh, also, move to quantum computing, which moves away from the atom and then down to the quantum level. But the, the, the problem with that is, is that it's not going to be in your house. That requires some extreme cooling, and that will reverse. That would re, that would reverse four decades of decentralization and put us back into the mainframe era. Not something I particularly am interested in doing. I don't know about you, uh, but I'm not interested in going back to there. Been there, done that, don't want to do it again. Um, and then we could move to carbon nanotubes on thin film transistors that Berkeley has shown, uh, the, that the Berkeley Labs has shown. So I think it'll be an interesting time. It, uh, I wouldn't worry too much about it. I, I think things will be fine. Uh, it's just that things, uh, as far as application development, are going to change rapidly. Uh, parallelization is going to become more important, and we're going to have to look to the high-performance computing world for guidance on how to do that. Um, programmers are going to learn a whole, whole new way of doing things. And SMP is going to have to disappear uh, because it, it also is expensive in, in the amount of overhead that it creates. So I hope you found this interesting. Uh, I hope you found it informative. And uh, I have a few more ideas. And uh, so I'll see you again real soon. <laughs> Please like and subscribe. And uh, goodbye for now.